So if I need to do this, Tiffany, I need a password. Okay. This is all Thank you. all for coming again. Good morning, good morning. Thank you guys again. So again, my name is Tanya Samuels. I'm the current DFAC chair here in District 23. And welcome to my school, PS 156, where I have a scholar downstairs. And I also have a scholar upstairs at 392. <laughs> and my daughter also graduated from 392. I've been here quite the time. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this is a long journey coming. I won't take up much of your time. I want to appreciate everyone who came out today. We're few, but it's quality. And that's what I'll take quality over quantity anytime. So we'll get started. You know we can't do anything without prayer. So we're going to open up with prayer for Minister Javon Howard. And I have to give a big shout out to my partner, Stop Hiding Inc. Tiff, Nikita, thank you so much, guys, for doing this with me again. Greetings to everybody. I literally, before I get into prayer, I literally just got out of a funeral for the shooting that took place in Brooklyn with the father and son that was tragically killed and the, the emotions that was there. But the key thing is that the community was there, standing with the family in the midst of this. So as everybody is here in the room, I just want to give yourself a round of applause for being here to hear this conversation that we're going to have today that's going to be very helpful to our community. Let's go into prayer. Can you bow your head in prayer? Father, we thank you for just this opportunity to be in your room again. We thank you for this opportunity where the community can gather in one unison, God, just to have a conversation, oh God, to discuss the things that goes on beyond ourselves, God. God, we pray that you would Allow your power and your spirit to rest in this room, God. We ask that, God, everything that has came out today, God, let it be fruitful, God. Let it be a, a time for us to grow as one another, but also a time for us to learn those moments that our community goes through. The trauma, the pain of sexual abuse, those things that are often talked about, God. Even as a person who also have experienced abuse. I thank you that I can speak as a testimony for the conversations that of healing and victory that will take place in this room, God. We seal this prayer even now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. privilege to be here. I want to thank the Samuels and I want to thank Tiffany and I want to thank our Deputy Borough President of the Spirit Security Council and to all of you who have assembled. Um, so, as you, all of you know, I grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in my core. Um, and as I travel all throughout the state, I meet a lot of young people. One of the first things that I hear from young people as it relates to <coughs> sexual abuse, which is a really difficult topic to discuss, 
is they won't believe me. Is they won't believe me. And where do I go? And oftentimes, what we have to do is look for the telltale signs of children who are withdrawn, their body language, their inability to express themselves, because children are normally forward-facing, children are normally very gregarious, children are normally very social. And when you see a child that was once social and then becomes withdrawn, then you must, all of us, although you may not be a mandated reporter, you have a moral responsibility to say, are you okay with my child? Is everything okay? You can talk to me. It's okay. And what we have this morning are individuals who have experienced the trauma of sexual abuse. And this is the face of abuse. But it's important to understand this is not the face of victims. This is the face of individuals who have been victorious. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Children are counting us to protect them. And we cannot do this by avoiding these difficult discussions. And, uh, and it's important that all of us must take action now. I'm the Attorney General of the State of New York. The criminal prosecution of these crimes in, in Brooklyn is Eric Gonzalez, the DA. I, my office, has limited criminal jurisdiction. We focus primarily on civil cases. I'm sure you saw the major civil case that I'm involved in right now, but we won't go there. <laughs> but what we do in terms of criminal is I focus on criminal rings. So individuals who engage in drug trafficking, individuals who engage in smuggling, individuals who engage in human trafficking, and also in gun trafficking. That's what we focus on, on a statewide basis and also interstate, other states. So if you want to know what's the role of the Attorney General versus the District Attorney, Eric Gonzalez is in Brooklyn focusing on crimes in the borough of Brooklyn. Brooklyn were day-to-day -day crimes, theft, robbery, assaults, arson, things like that, shootings. What does Tish James focus on? Civil investigations, where you want to change behavior and when you, when you go for damages, money, and when you, when you want to go for corrective action. And also, she focuses on schemes. And she focuses on primarily individuals who are engaging in trafficking of all kinds, human trafficking, arms trafficking, and gun trafficking. I've been working with the district attorney as well as with the federal government, the Department of Justice, focusing on a lot of these motels and hotels where we're seeing individuals who have engaged in human trafficking. And if you know of any information, you can be assured that you can reach out to me. I'm very accessible and provide me with in, uh, information. We are also seeing individuals who are victims of sexual assault, but we are also seeing individuals who are being trafficked and who have nowhere to go. Most recently, not too far from here, the district attorney in my office and DOJ broke up a big prostitution ring that was basically engaging in prostitution openly in East New York, not too far from CCC. And so we keep, we're keeping our eyes on that neighborhood uh, because no one, no one, no one should be the victim of prostitution because it is not a victimless crime. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that again, uh, we go in, uh, we primarily focus not on the women, but a lot on the Johns. Because it's important that if you, again, address the demand and let people know that these women and these men are victims, that obviously we can do something about it and that they should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. The Center for D Disease Control estimates that every 13 seconds, a child is abused. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. A child is abused. Physically, sexually, emotionally, neglect. And there's all types of neglect. The failure to educate your child is an act of neglect, educational neglect. The 
failure to give your child emotional support when you continue to tell children you're not, a, you're not going to amount to anything. When individuals are traumatized because they've been in relationships that haven't worked out, you're no good just like your mama, just like your daddy. You're too dark, you're too light. Your hair's too nappy, your hair's too straight. You don't have citizenship, you're a migrant, you shouldn't have come to this country. Emotional abuse, you're too skinny, you're too fat. You'll never be anything. Some children think that their first name is a curse word because they've been called MF so much. And I, you've seen it, I've seen it. All you gotta do sometimes is just go out and you see out there individuals who refer to their children. Come here, you little so-and-so. Abuse. The failure to provide food to your children. If you don't have any food in your refrigerator, that can be a form of neglect. Sometimes it's just poverty and we've gotta help that family. You as educators and I, as the legal officer of the state, we've got a, we have a special responsibility to our children, all of us. And that is why I'm so grateful that we are convening this meeting here this morning. All of you have come together to raise awareness about this problem and also to speak about your pain, but also your progress. Put a face to it and let people know that you're no longer suffering and that you want to make a difference in the life of someone else. More than that, you are here to, in, to invest the necessary and provide the necessary resources so that we can prevent this from happening again. And to tell children, all of you, to tell into children who are within your supervision that you should trust me, that you can talk to me, that I am not here to hurt you, I'm not here to harm you, that I love you and I believe you, that I believe you. Simple words. I believe you. It's a responsibility and unfortunately this issue is happening. We've got so many problems in central Brooklyn. But not just central Brooklyn. It's not just limited to central Brooklyn, but it's happening all over. So we have a, a moral responsibility to break the cycle. You're going to hear from some experts who have broken the cycle and have gone on to do amazing, amazing things authors and teachers and scholars and leaders in our community. I am just really honored and privileged and humbled just to be amongst them. And it's important that we teach one another. So with that, I'm going to shut up because I want to hear from them and I'm sure you want to hear from them. But I just want you to know that as the Attorney General that I'm only a phone call away or you can come up and talk to me about a number of issues. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be in this space it's truly an honor and a privilege to be a part of a panel that is improving the lives of others, but specifically focusing on our babies. God bless you and thank you. We appreciate you taking the time out to be here. Um, everyone, my name is Tiffany Tucker Parrier. I'm the president of Stop Hiding Inc. And we appreciate all of you being here today because we know this conversation is not easy. But what's important, again, is that we are courageous. We're here to have a courageous conversation. And so we also have with us our Deputy Bur Brooklyn Deputy Borough President, Kim Council. Please come up. I will be brief. I promise I'll be brief. Um, uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Two years are honored and privileged to be here with the Reverend Dr. Tish James. Um, also known as your Attorney General. I'm bringing you greetings on behalf of Antonio Reynoso, who is our Brooklyn Borough President. Uh, we know that the last few years have been really stressful on us, um, but even more stressful on our children, uh, because as we were stuck in place uh, and parents had to deal with some of the frustration that they were dealing with, we know that there was an increase um, in the abuse that they had to deal with. So I'm so honored and privileged to be here today with these individuals who have turned their trauma into triumph, um, who have turned their pain uh, into, uh, into purpose. Um, and we'll share with you uh, how they got over and what they are doing right now as parents. Uh, we have to make sure that we're creating safe spaces for our children so that they feel that they can come um, and talk to us about what it is that they're going on. And as the AG said, we have to be hypervigilant um, because not only would they become withdrawn, but perhaps they would become hypersexualized. 
you got to pay attention to the telltale signs. Um, and so we as a borough, we as a community, we as a group of, of people who, um, who have been through so much um, have to make sure that we are creating these types of safe environments. So very special thank you to all of you for showing up here today, to the organization Stop Hiding, um, for shining a light on something that flourishes in the dark. So we have to make sure that we are transparent and continue to speak truth to power. Thank you. Let's hear it again for everyone that does the Hi, my name is Molly Cooper and I'll be your host for today. I just want to congratulate you guys for being in this room. You guys have the power, you guys have the voice. Um, you are the ones that are going back inside the homes, inside the communities, dealing directly with children. And so you guys get to play a part in this vision and this mission. Um, and so with that said, I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves briefly. Um, and so we're going to have that. Renee is, okay, we'll be back soon. <laughs> All right, but um, Samora Jones is in the building, and Gerald Hoover, did I pronounce that correctly? Gerald. Gerald Hoover. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, so you, they're going to introduce themselves briefly before we dive into questions um, so that they can share their story more with you. Folks, <laughs> my name is uh, Samora Jones. Uh, I am an emotional restoration coach. Um, I also am an author, uh, as well as the regional manager of an organization called Care Portal, where we connect uh, ACS agencies to churches to meet the needs of children within each community. Uh, my story, and I, are we going into story yet, or are we, are we diving into We're this? Diving into, diving into this, yeah. So um, that is that is the foundation of um, why I was asked to come here today. I'm really excited to talk through, um, one, what has happened, um, what uh, has been, again, turning that victim uh, situation into a triumphant situation, and then uh, practical tools that I have been able to utilize to not just help myself but others. I'm, I'm Gerald Hoover. I'm with my Vernon, but I'm from the Bronx. As I told uh, my team panel earlier, I claim both, especially when I did street trade. Um, I'm a best selling author, uh, professor at LIE Brooklyn Adjunct, uh, work on Job Corps. And um, I joined the when I was five years old, the first encounter of abuse from my babysitter. And I continued for several years. Nine years old, that again. I developed a stubborn, a stubborn problem to where I got a trauma piece. But the major thing about it is that I became a motivational speaker where I was able to travel the world. I'm not telling my story just about sex abuse, I haven't really spoken about that, but just getting young men and young women to make progress. Uh, I could have been a victim, or I was a victim, but I could have been an assassin. But by his gosh, I have a fight in me, a will, and failure doesn't resonate with me very well. Mm -hmm. I have a fear of failure. And so I'm able to take those two to help not only myself, but others. That's why I'm here. Okay. Now, what you'll hear from these panelists is that, yes, they were a victim. However, they became victorious in that. And so there's power in using your story. If you're someone who's been through any trauma or sexual abuse, there's power in your story. If you were a victim, you can be the victor. You can be the person, just like these lovely people, who then use your story to help others and be that light. Um, let's have uh, Renee come up and introduce herself as well. You can have my seat here. Everyone, I'm Renee Cox. I'm a school counselor who have worked with children a little over 30 years, and I want to be the voice of children. I'm advocating just to let people know that you can do it in spite of what you may go through. That in the sun will shine another day. 
So one of my reasons for becoming a counselor is because of my own experience and seeing other people go through things. Um, when I was growing up, I had a friend who was able to basically just do anything she wanted to do. I was like, wow, I want to be like her. My mother said, no, you can't hang out with her. Not understanding that because her mom was an alcoholic, she really wasn't able to really attend to her and pay attention to her the way that she should have been paying attention to her. So my friend ended up being molested herself, and she ended up, you know, being with a lot of different people as a result of it and watching her kids being taken away bothered me. I myself was molested when I was younger, but I wasn't able to tell my mom at the time that it was like somebody that I knew. So I wanted to be someone who could say, you know what, you can do this. You could become better. You don't have to go down this, this path, but these are things that you can do. So I am here to make a difference, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult. This is what I do. I try to get people to get back on the right track. Like someone said earlier, not only does it hurt the people, but it hurts your family because it's something that you take with you throughout life. But if we can prevent it, then no one has to go through it anymore, that would be something that's great. And to let you know that even if you've been in pain, you are responsible for your healing. A lot of times people don't see that part. Okay, you've been through some changes, you've been through some challenges. Some people are like, well, if my mother wasn't this, I wouldn't be this. If my father wasn't this, no. You can learn something from everyone. You know what you can learn from your mom? This is what I'm not going to do. Or this is what I am going to do. So either way, you can learn something from someone. So I would say to take that with you and moving forward, no, you can learn something from everybody, what you should do or what you should not do. Thank you for sharing that. Of their story, and I'm going to ask a few questions um, for them to explain a little bit more and go deeper into their story. But for those of you in the room, you know your story. You might not be able to share it here and now, but you know your story. And I think the biggest question for the kids in the room. So glad that you're here. Good, okay. right? But I think the most powerful thing to ask yourself is, what will your story do? And that's a great question to ask. You know your story, and there's power in that, right? What will you do with your story? Whose life will you change? Who will you empower? Who will you help to get to the other side of victory? And so that's why we're here today to empower I. Um, you know, the Attorney General mentioned earlier um, that children sometimes just want to hear, I believe you. And I have uh, the Victoria story of having my mother believe me. Right? And so I know what it's like to be in a space where I'm empowered even though I might have experienced that myself. And so we've created this space so that you can be empowered to know that we believe you. All right? Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to start with a panelist, right? Um, and you can start from Samora down. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, that to, to us personally that you experienced sexual abuse uh, at a very young age. And I guess my question is, did you tell anyone at the time um, and why did you tell someone, or why not, if you did? So, um, you first, could give a briefing of yeah, your story. Yeah, well. that's what I was like. I was like, first, let's talk about the story, right? Um, so, when I was six years old, um, and before I, I always, uh, before I start my story, I always say, that, you know, my prayer is that um, that as I share and even even when else shares our story, that it doesn't uh, cause you to relive a traumatic experience. That it doesn't, um, you know. Um, we hurt you or have you walk down that this is a safe space um, to talk openly and honestly about what you have experienced um, and my prayer is that this be a place where you can begin like that healing process if you have not already begun that journey and it or if you've done it that it continues you on that path of healing and so when I was six years old uh, unfortunately my father molested me uh, and he did it for about a year uh, I got to a place where uh, my dad was actually like really like my superhero. We were really close. So I didn't understand why someone I was so close to and that I loved so much was hurting me in this particular way. The language that he would utilize was that, you know, you don't need to tell anyone because it would not just hurt our relationship, but it would hurt other people. It would break up our family. 
And so that took a while for me to get to that place where I would say anything because I didn't want to be responsible for breaking up my family. You know, I was six. That was, I, I, I did not have the ability to break up my family. You know, it was this adult's actions towards a child that was breaking, hurting, harming uh, me and my family. Uh, I remember going into the room and my sisters and I were playing around and uh, I finally said that, you know, to my older sister, you know, daddy did, daddy did this to me. And she, right, for example, so that, um, that my dad hurt me. And she said, and she was only four years older than me, she was like, there's no way. He would have never done that you saw that somewhere or someone told you that it couldn't have happened. And I remember going to, uh, her going to my mother and telling my mother what I said and my mom going into the back room to yell at my dad that, did that happen? Did you do that? And they had an argument and at the end of the night, my mom and my dad came in the room together and talked to me and said, uh, you know, what you're, the lies that you're telling is going to cause your father to go to jail. And I remember my dad saying, do you want to see me in handcuffs? Do you want to see me go to jail? Do you want to break up our family? And, and it, to me, as a child, it reinforced that me telling, one, they didn't believe me, or two, they did believe me, but was not willing to take the consequences of what would happen with those actions after. Um, luckily enough, uh, my sister told a school counselor, and the school counselor was the one that reported it to ACS and had us removed from school. Now, was there a few things that happened after the fact that we'll go down that journey a little bit later on, but um, my fear was that I would break up the family, and for all sense and purposes, I did, but in the best way possible. Like, there's a need to break up. If this is the family structure, then the family needed to break up. Now, um, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, it was hard for me to process what that meant, what that looked like, what that felt like. Uh, but now looking back, it was what needed to happen in order for that existence of my life to end. So, yeah. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. Same question. For me, I, I was five years old, and I got picked up by my uh, you know, babysitter, who was a twin. Well, her mother, the, the babysitter, her mother and her mother were best friends, living in uh, passive projects in Mount Sinai uh, in the Bronx. So when it first happened, I didn't quite know what was going on, but it, was, it, it seemed to happen over years. As a matter of fact, she had four sisters. I remember even a case with the kids on it, a, a case where I would be touched by both of them. Then I walked out of the room and saw the two of them together. My mom came back in the room. So not only did I see incest, I, I saw lesbian, lesbian, lesbian. So I saw a lot of things before I was even six, seven years old. Then I got touched again when I was nine by a, a, a friend of mine's aunt. So before I was even 12 years old, I had experienced some sort of, some form of sexual abuse or sexual activity more than 20 times. So they make it hypersexual, yeah. I mean, I was a typical teenager, but then I had that on steroids because I heard it was touch. I didn't know how to cultivate a relationship between boy and girl, so the boys and girlfriends. Everything went towards sex even to the point where I was able to talk to older women at 12 or 13 years old. I mean, literally now, I don't think I can talk to anybody, but I was even nerdier back then. But for some reason, I grew up very fast. Of course, at boys, you know, you hear things about sex uh, destructively. Like, there's many girls you can, you know, do this and do that, which is special, special, especially back in the old days in the 70s. It was really destroying me, but I didn't know it. I didn't tell my mother something like that again. My baby said, girl, 
before, as my child said, destroy family. So I, I basically held all that in until so about 19 years old. I remember I was on a bus coming from North State to Washington, D.C. And I had a uh, breakdown on the bus. I wasn't screaming crying. I know I wasn't screaming, but I was crying, you know, to myself in my seat. Then I realized that I didn't have a child. I went from five years old to 19. Everything was blood. Everything was sexualized. So I didn't have a chance to even grow. And I thought, how do I even process information? How do I go to school? I mean, how do I even make it past high school? And I think I'm thankful that I didn't try to touch the girls. Uh, you know, I told them right with the will. Everything was mental because that's what happened to me. So I was able to, I guess, manipulate a situation because that's what happened to me. And so as I realized how tough it really was, and I realized what happened to me, I started taking steps to help myself. And it's been a journey. I'm 57 years old now, so I, I've been living with this over 50 years. And um, my purpose in life is to help as many people as I can. And I'm finally actually coming out in public with this because I, I'm an author, I write books, I said before I write books, but not about this. But my challenge now is to help as many people as I can because this is a serious topic. I mean, this, this is crushing your life. You know, Gerald, I'm so grateful that you're able to share that and taking the power back in what we say is stop hiding. Um, and especially for our males, um, right? Or anyone, as a matter of fact. As an adult, what we see is repercussions of what they've been through, right? Um, it's oftentimes hypersexual or unfortunately ending up in the prison system or sometimes, like in his case, uh, using the story for power, right? Um, using that to overcome and not to allow that to identify you or to hold you back or to set you back. Um, and so for both of you, the next question I really have for you is if you would have done anything differently, would you have? I'm like, I know, I know that I don't, I don't believe in like, uh, the who I am today is an accumulation of all of my experiences, all the lessons that I learned, all the things that I met, good and bad. And I really like me today. Um, so I wouldn't do anything as crazy as it sounds to change anything because it allowed me the opportunity to not only um, be understanding and compassionate to someone else who shares my story, but also to even have compassion towards my father who caused a lot of the damage in my story. Um, he was someone who was uh, molested when he was a child. He was beaten when he was a kid. Um, and it's not an excuse for him to pass on that trauma to me, um, but it allowed me to see his humanity and the help that he needed. Um, and I believe that it has made me more uh, compassionate to you know, my, my, my brethren. I have a different understanding. Uh, I tell you one thing, I have no room to judge nobody about nothing, right? Like there is a, uh, a humanhood that I, that I have due to the accumulation of my experiences. Um, I, would, uh, I would say that if there is a, uh, a moment of not even external of, of, my, of myself was I gave up a lot in the midst of a lot of those spaces and I robbed people of the opportunity to help me because I didn't say anything um, often. That like once I learned that, uh, or I believe I should say, that me speaking caused the issues, it would be slower for me to talk. Because now remember, my dad told me, hey, if you say this, you're going to destroy the family. And a, a six-year-old doesn't understand that, this, that the family wasn't being destroyed, that safety protocols were coming in. Right. I just saw the breaking of what I knew as my normal home. And sometimes even chaos feels comfortable because it's what you know. And when someone kind of tries to come in and interjects a new normal for you, it can feel scary, it can feel overwhelming, and uh, it feels like that uh, what you knew would, or what you thought would happen about breaking is going to happen. But sometimes breaking is necessary for you to get to the part of that healing uh, journey. So the only thing that I would say is that I, I wish that I would have spoken up more often 
um, and not be so scared of what I couldn't control anyway. All right. For me, if I was able to change anything, because it happened so often, so quickly, to experience purity, purity, I never knew what that was. And I think that's probably why I had that breakdown when I was like this, when I you know, started crying and when I was like, I never experienced what it was to be a virgin, or to have a girlfriend, and to experience some of you know, sound never, or even get to wait until I got married. I never had that experience, so I think that is what I would change. Um, I like who I am now. I love what I love who I am now because I'm a lot stronger. But if I had to change, I would still want to do what I'm doing as far as being a service provider. But being able to experience love the right way for the first time is purity. But again, we live in such a fallen world that that's hard to come by anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think this is why this is so important because the, the act of sex is it's a number. Because on one hand, it can be the greatest thing on earth because you can have pleasure in a committed relationship. Also, you can work with it. That's how we got here. So it works. But when it's done in a destructive way, like drinking, drink too much, you get drunk, you mess up your liver and everything else, it can cause problems. So one of the greatest things on earth that can be a blessing can also be something to destroy a person. <clears throat> so thank you guys for sharing that. Um, that is so powerful. I'm, I'm even processing that even now still. But I guess my other question before we get started with the next segment, um, and I know some more for you, you had entered into the system and just different things like that. And you can share a little bit about that experience um, but knowing what you know now, right, how do you guys feel about uh, sexual abuse now as an adult and how have you been advocating um, and what's the best way to help someone along the journey of life if they're in that situation currently of bringing that out in the open? Yeah. Uh, my, my experience with the system is a little bit complicated uh, so I like I, like I said in the, the beginning, I went into foster care. Uh, once my sister had told one of the counselors in school, they they came and got me from the school. They came to me from school, which in itself um, was a, a very hard thing because they didn't do a lot of explaining to me of like of what would happen, of the why. What they did tell me is that hey, you're gonna be safe now. We're going to take you, you know, we know what's been happening at home and now you're going to be safe. Unfortunately, that wasn't my story. Um, I was taken uh, into uh, a foster home where the, my foster mother, she actually worked for BCW. That just tells you how old I am because they don't call that BCW anymore. Um, they call it ACS, uh, but that was the Bureau of Child Welfare. She was a social worker there and she was also uh, my foster parent, but I was the child that you saw on the news who was locked up and caged and starved and beaten. And so I went from one bad situation to the, another bad situation. Mm. And so when they told me I would be safe, I just found a new pain. Um, and so it was a part of it was a part of me not believing that help was there and that the adults who were supposed to be my caregivers would actually mm -hmm. care for me. Um, so it, it, it's, it, uh, it caused me to very much like depend on myself. And so I grew up very self-sufficient. Like I'm going to, if something needs to happen, I'm going to make it happen, which in some ways worked out because I'm successful here. I got, you know, all these things, but uh, I needed people to uh, be a part of that community. And I had teachers. I had a teacher in my school who would allow me to sit with her at lunch and just talk. I had a teacher who would pour into me and tell me that I was smart and beautiful. And she didn't even know the full details of what I was going through. But her presence made a difference. I would go to you know church and believe it. It's crazy enough, the, my foster parents who were abusing me were deacons in the church. <laughs> And so we would go to church and I would have, there was a lady at that church 
who would um, make sure that I ate every time that she saw me. Because she was like, you're so skinny, you're so skinny. You know, because you could see like my skeleton. And so she would make sure that I had food and that um, if I, she would buy me like little outfits because she would see that they weren't providing clothes for me. You know, so I had these people who would show up and that showed me that everybody wasn't the same. That someone cared, that someone was willing to love on me, support me, and be there. So that if I was going to tell someone, I told the one who demonstrated the action of care. So what I would say to people now is I'm like, you cannot control who does what, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell. You can't control what anyone else does, but saying nothing is more damaging to yourself than it is to having, um, to having the, the word out, out there. I was able to tell a teacher, I was able to tell a woman in church, I was able to talk to um, you know, a babysitter that I had who just used to pray for me. You know, and just let me know that God didn't forget me. And it was the the spots of light in my life that kept me going in very, very dark seasons and places. And as an adult now who works within the system, um, I always, I deal with the adult first. My conversations with the adult is how can I help you deal with what's going on with you so that you do not inflict your pain onto your children? or your cousins or the people who are around you because if I can help you walk through your brokenness, you're less likely to bring them. And so um, remember the humanity of the adult and also not do not be afraid to allow your children a safe space to speak and say, even if you don't have the answer. I think the adults in my life were so caught up in the fact that I was telling them that something was wrong and they felt like they um, it was their fault and they didn't know what to do with it. They were overwhelmed for it, so they continued these, uh, this poor behavior. And so um, it was, as a child, don't be afraid to speak up. As an adult, do the work so that you can be the safe space for the child. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, well, my question to you is, what would you say are some of the signs of uh, someone that is being sexually abused? I've never seen that. Um, kind of hard to tell, to, to put that in one sentence. But as a boy, or a male, you have to watch patterns. If they're over sexualized, things that they say. Um, if you see them touching themselves a lot, you see them touch, touch other people a lot, over aggressive. Um, if you see what they're drawing, you have to get them to say a teacher or a parent, or they receive. They draw a little images of genitalia and stuff like that, but testing you, trying to download porn, of course. But there are a lot of things now that you can probably see from a boy's perspective. And when people as a male, I think a lot of times you may not say anything because of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Especially if a male touched another male. <laughs> it, would, it, would, it would be very hard for, I'm going to say it would be very hard. Chances are it would be difficult for a Male to say something about a male touch me. Now, if female touch me, I still don't say anything. So I can imagine if you ever made it, I would touch my male, especially in those days when I grew up. Now it's like different, but in the 70s, when I grew up, it was male this way, female that way. So I can't imagine if you what a person was doing right now. But again, if you see telltale signs of a person who's drawn, angry all the time, touching themselves or, 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 or touching others, you would probably. Tell that right. Hello, good afternoon. I'm so, so sorry about that. Thank you for that. Oh, All right, so let's hear it for Gerald. And um, thank you so much for sharing your story and being so vulnerable. There is such a power in that. Uh, Ms. Cox, I know you introduced yourself earlier. Um, but why don't you introduce yourself a little bit in terms of the people who are in the room. We're going to kind of dive into some youth uh, segments as well because we have youths in the room. Um, Ms. Cox, I know you are a guidance counselor, and so you've worked a lot uh, with youths and just different things like that. Why don't you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Um, sometimes you would have um, children come to school and realize that they've been abused by their behavior, things they do, like before I had a girl who 
because of her abuse, she will wear big baggy clothing. And she said, because I don't want to feel attracted, because that's what attracted is, you know, it's my fault. A lot of times, the child will think that it's his or her fault, and it's not their fault, but that's what they're being told, or something that they believe. So she will wear certain clothing just to throw everybody else off, or she wants to look like a boy, as opposed to dressing like she normally would. So we see a lot of that going on. We see children blame themselves a lot. A lot of times that comes from being abused. If you just have to just be mindful. Like at a certain age, you really shouldn't be wetting yourself. So you want to pay attention to that. Sometimes the bad dreams and things that they're living in, or thinking about it, or withdrawal. Withdrawal is so important. The things that they used to do, they don't do anymore. Or they'd rather be by themselves all the time, or they look depressed. So you want to ask questions and just be aware of the change that's going through. You know, or they're always angry, like, why are you so angry? But they'd be angry for many different reasons. So you see a lot of different things like that. You see a lot of times that children will have a lot of sex partners because they forget about their self-worth because they don't feel like they're worth what they once was. So it's important just to, you know, pay attention to those things that you can see a child or if you experience yourself to know that, you know what, I am worth something. I am somebody because I was created to be someone. I was created in God's image. So we have to learn our self-worth that, you know what, even if something did happen, that, you know what, I have an opportunity to turn the situation around. I have an opportunity to become better, to help someone else. I don't understand why it happened, but it happened. So I do work with children. I work with families and trying to get people on the right track. Sometimes as a, a person that may be a mother or a father, because of the abuse that they've been through, they don't know how to relate to their children. So what happens sometimes, everybody has a coping mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to cope. Some people cope by drinking alcohol. Some people cope by doing drugs. Some people cope by having sex with everyone. Some people cope by robbing or stealing or lying. But everybody has a coping mechanism. It just depends on how you do it. Some people cope by just going to church all the time. It is a coping mechanism. So you just have to figure out, okay, so is my coping mechanism helping me? Is it something that's making it worse? And I tell the person who just got drunk, when you finish, guess what? And it's all over and done with. You still have the same problem, but now you've added a problem to it. So a lot of times we don't really realize that, but I do find that through talking, talking about it, talking about how you can become better, expressing yourself, okay, you angry, let's find you someone that you can vent and talk to, let's get through it. Together we can get through it. By ourselves, we can't. You go into a state of depression, and then you'll end up in somebody's hospital where you don't want to be at. But you can get through it. So these are some of the things that I do. Um, I work with the children. I work with the family, just trying to reunite people and bring them back together again. Because we all play a part in this world, some way, somehow. We didn't accidentally come here. No matter how you came, it wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. You can say it was an accident, but it wasn't an accident because God don't make no mistakes. So we have to realize that, you know, this is something that we can do. Just working together to figure out, you know, how we can become better and just seeing things. I've seen a young lady who ended up being a prostitute at 13 years old because of what she's been through. And then her mom was busy and did not see it. And what happened was the John came and he just took her back and forth. And the thing was, he said, like, well, you don't do A, B, and C, now I'm wrong for your sister. Because once he felt like she was used up, he had a sister that was two years younger than her. So that's when she panicked, because she had a great love for her sister. I want to protect my little sister. But she ended up, unfortunately, missing. I never saw her again. She was on the flyers, and it did break my heart that she was my student. You know, she tried to get away. I don't know what happened to her. But we tried to get her help before that, because the DA and everybody was involved. But she ended up missing. Who knows if she went to a witness protection program or if she just missed and missed I never saw her again. Thank you, Dr. Scott. But, you know, what, guys, I want you to hear uh, from all these stories is that there's hope. All right? There is hope and that you are a part of that bringing hope. Into, like I said earlier, into your communities, into your homes, into the school, right, system, um, into the uh, college institutions into ACS and just many different things that we do tomorrow. So there is hope, all right? So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next guest and we're going to call her TJ. Um, and she's zooming in and she's just going to share her personal experience 
um, about her, uh, you know, like sexual abuse and just different things like that, how she's encountered that. So TJ, go ahead. Thanks for being here today, by the way. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name, you can um, call me TJ. And I was touched when I was uh, around 12, 13 years old. My older cousin would come into the bedroom and he would touch me while his mom was asleep and everyone was asleep. So I, as I became a teenager and got older, I, I thought that was the way it was supposed to be done. Instead, men were offering me money to take care of their sexual needs and to look at me and for me to touch them and stuff like that. So at 14 and stuff like that, I was taking money from older guys. Um, and then I just fell into that trap and I just, all of a sudden, every single day, I just was taking money from all the guys from I was like 14 to around maybe 28. And um, that was my, that, that was the way I coped. And do you have any questions for me? Yes, thank you. Thank you for being here, TJ, again. We really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, I, my first question would be, how did you get started? Um, what age, I think you mentioned it earlier, um, and who introduced you um, to that space, and what attacked What attacked Oh, you did. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna move on to the next question. What did you okay. need, what did you need that you weren't getting at home um, or at school? Like, what were some of the things that you needed in that season? Uh, that you weren't getting? Yeah, I needed money. I needed money for clothes, food things. Well, you know, I, I, I had money for food, but I mean, I had food at home, but I wanted McDonald's and stuff like that. But I guess an allowance. A lot of kids had allowances, and I wasn't getting that at home, so I was, I was able to get that from guys and men that were older than me. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay in that lifestyle? Uh, maybe 10 years or so. Okay. And how did you leave and why? Yes, I, um, I was, every night I would drink when I would do the parties. So uh, I stopped drinking, so I stopped going to the parties. So that's basically how I stopped. Okay. And did you care for your life at any time, Jake? Okay. Uh, yes, you care for your life because you're not sure who you're dealing with, but you kind of go through with it. Okay. And I guess one of my final questions is, like, did you have any regrets um, going through this as a teenager um, and the lifestyle that you found into? Did you have any regrets at all? Yes, I have regrets. I think that I should have just waited until I got a little older and was working my own job instead of taking money and things from men. Okay. And we have a few teens and uh, young people in the room, TJ. Um, so your story and you sharing this is giving them voice as well. So again, we appreciate you sharing and uh, being so vulnerable with your story and your journey. What would be something for those teens and youths in the room that you would share? Uh, you being someone who has been through that personal experience, what would you share with them to advise them? Maybe not to listen to all the hip hop because they're promoting like pr prostitution real heavy to me. So maybe they should just, you know, wait until they finish college, bring the school, open up their own business, uh, get a good job, and get uh, their own money. They don't have to rely on anyone else for money. And you don't really have to listen to all that hip hop stuff word for word. You could just enjoy yourself with it. But a lot of the hip hop uh, music today, to me, they're, um, promoting from, um, prostitution and things like that. So that's what I would tell the younger youth. Thank you for that. 
Um, and now that you're you're experiencing victory on the other side, um, what is your vision and dream for your life? Do you want children? Um, you know, like have you been able to expand that vision for yourself after going through all that you did? Yes. Uh... in different states or even different countries. Sorry, I missed um, that. Go ahead again. Yes, I'd like to own properties in different states or maybe different countries. And that's my dream and my goal is to just go after it and work to succeed it. And you will. All right, guys. Yes, Another question today, um, has your experience uh, impacted your ability to love? I know that's something uh, one of our panelists talked about earlier, but what was that like for you? Yeah, it's kind of um, hard because I'm so used to having money on the dresser, or I'm not sure if that's the way we should put it. So it's kind of hard to, especially make love and stuff like that. I'm so used to having money on the dresser that sometimes I have to hear there's like money coming in order. It's like a, um, I don't know, a psychological thing with it. Right. But yeah, it does have impact on the way you love. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then final question, what are some of the warning signs we should um, look for if we have teenagers ourselves or young people in our surroundings because we have a lot of adults in the room as well. Um, what are some warning signs we can look for to help um, our young people not to get involved in that lifestyle? Maybe having an attitude and too much peer pressure and wanting to be loved by everyone. Thank you. Hey, everyone, thank you for um, signing in today. Uh, let's hear it for TJ, guys. We all here in this room love, respect, and honor you for sharing your story. There's power in that. Keep sharing and keep overcoming. Um, we're cheering you on. Thank you so much for signing in today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, so there are a lot of young people that are struggling in different ways, shape, and form. Uh, I think you guys have all heard from the panelists today, TJ yourself, like some of the signs to look for. Um, you know, the question you can ask yourself is how can I make a difference? How can I look out for different signs? How can I be a guiding light to help young people get out to the other side of victory, right? And to overcome to become, because that's why we're all here. We all have a story, like I mentioned before, um, and so that's important. I guess I have just a few more questions for you, Ms. Cox. Um, Okay. All right. So these questions are, I think, great questions that you guys might also have in mind um, to ask uh, us. So, uh, anyone watch C CSI? Do mm -hmm. right? Law and Order. Mm -hmm. I grew up watching that. It was so good. <laughs> right. But uh, with that and those uh, 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 shows, uh, TV shows in mind. Would you guys say the investigation happens in the same realm? Uh, <laughs> no. You can answer a little bit of that for us some more. No. Uh, like, what does that look like in reality? Uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no. There is, the, the truth of the matter is, there is a lot of resources and there are a lot of help out there, but we do have a very like broken system as well. Um, we have a system that is, uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I work at the organization that I do is that we're a part of trying to unbloat the system of force Because like 75% of all cases that are ACS cases are neglect cases. They're not even abuse cases. So if we got, uh, and that's because they're criminalizing poverty. So if we were able to get resources to um, to the families who just need financial or resource assistance without it being uh, such a, uh, a process that breaks up the family or that uh, doesn't uh, provide in the way that's needed and necessary, uh, you, would, you would have a better fueled system 
that can deal with the abuse that is actually happening. So uh, the process that I went through, um, there was lack of communication of what resources that my mother could have gotten in order to get us out of the system. There was um, there was a support system around um, you know for her within the community that we were in. You know, so there was um, uh, even the the court officers because you have a once you have a a case uh, you have a court appointed attorney you have a caseworker you have um, all of these adults who are in positions that are supposed to be a part of helping to secure the safety of the child, to provide what the, what the family needs, to cause a restoration, right? And just remove whatever issue is happening. But there's so many broken components or overwhelmed systems that you kind of just, sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, you have a very long process that, that, um, that happens. But, um, that's why counselors in your schools, uh, you know, community advocates, um, you know, having, you know, even a community within your family are so vital and so important in having discussions like this because then you become the advocate for, you know, your, your floor, your building, the community that can help deal with uh, the, the lack that's happening within each other's homes. Thank you. Um, and what resources are available for the affected person or family? Um, well, uh, you, 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 I would say if you are a male, we count someone, don't hide. And I think we as men, macho, so we can take it. Mm -hmm. There's no crime getting help. And there's no weakness in Look at it. Jesus had to help. He had 12 guys that helped him. You know, one turned on him, but he, he had help. But he was Jesus, so <laughs> Jesus can get help, we can get help. So yeah. don't be yeah. such a man that you can't reach out. Yeah. There are, uh, so I was like, I was like, there are, with, within ACS, um, I know sometimes people hear ACS and feel social work, and the thing is, like, they're going to take my kids. Right, um, and so I don't want to tell because they're going to take my kids, and that's not always the result of it. Like a lot of times, you can go to ACS agencies before there is an issue where you just suspect maybe something is happening, or you just need support, and they can give you all of the community-based resources that they have access to, their grants that they have access to, um, that they can help with whatever it is that you're trying to. Uh, that you're trying to uh, accomplish with counseling, with uh, with therapy, you know, with other therapeutic services, um, and maybe uh, you have other ones that that you can go into as well. Basically, they do the, the counseling piece is very important, just to be able to express yourself, to be able to talk about what you're going through, to be able to heal. It's a healing process because until you heal, you really can't move forward. It's like you're always holding on to something. The past is very detrimental to you. It, it's not a positive one. So the council piece is where it helps people to heal. That when you go through, it's just having someone to talk to, to listen, not to judge you, not to interrupt you, not to tell you what they think or feel, but just to guide you in the right direction in a more positive way that you can actually express yourself. All right, so now um, we want to hear from the advocates in the room, which is you guys. Uh, if anyone has any question, you can raise your hands and stand up and ask your questions, and the panelists will be able to help guide any questions at all. Please. Let me go over my minutes. Go ahead. Hi. I'm Monique Thomas. Hey, everyone. I'm part of Stop Hiding Me. Um, I have a question for Ms. Cox. When, when was the last time, actually, that they actually gave up with searching for a young lady or 14 year old? Well, I couldn't really tell you because I moved on to another school. Um, so, and it was towards the end of the school year. But I know before I left, they did not find her. Her pictures were just up in the neighborhood. How long ago was this? This was over 10 years ago. Um, yeah. So 
Sometimes you gotta live moment to moment, but know that the fact that you're still living, you still have a chance. That is so good. That's so good. Oh, oh, sorry. Just real quick. So I am an advocate with sex trafficking. Um, quick, very quick. I, I rescued my daughter from sex trafficking in 14 to 18. Um, I was with the NYPD for safety. And then with that means um, time, it was very difficult. But I was able to save my daughter, bring her back home. So from then, I've been advocating in the community along with South Miami. And I have just recently um, investigated two cases with preventing sex trafficking. And it turned out uh, a great ordeal. You know, it was able, I was able to help two parents um, get in the process of doing a bit of touring. So I, I figured, I said, okay, this is, we're on to something now. You know, just being hands on with helping teens and keeping them home, keeping them safe. And that's what the initiative is what I want to go with. You know, so I'm looking for it. Oh, Pins Warrant. Oh, I'm sorry. The Pins Warrant is um, persons in need of supervision. And um, it's from 14 to basically 14 to 17. It can't be 18. And what it is, is when a child continues to keep um, running away from home, a parent, what they can do to protect themselves and to start initiating, initiating a court process to keep them, you know, to keep the parent, it actually protects the parent, you know, from getting arrested from any, um, you know, law by, um, you know, entities and stuff. But more, more so is to help bring the child to safety and to also get a court appearance of where, you know, the child has been doing this whole routine. It has to be like a whole routine of missing reports. So you can, like, for, as for me, I went through 15, up to like 15 missing reports. Um, no sleep, no sleep whatsoever, you know, to bring my daughter back home. But I did whatever it took, but, you know, you have to, protect yourself and also that's the process of what you have to do in order to get the pins warrant. And the pins warrant could indicate for the judge to state, well, since you've been missing from home such and such, you know, now we can just send you, they'll send them away, you know, um, up until they're 18 or so. It depends on the situation, so a group home or a facility where they can receive treatment and so forth. So, it, and it will actually help out more with the parent and the safety of the child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you so much. No problem. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Henry Bucknell. I'm a parent from District 18. My question is to you, because I have a long history of the system and the damages that it caused in my life and that of my children. You said that, um... I'm sorry to interrupt this, but no, everyone, the people in the back can't hear, so you're going to have to speak okay, a bit louder. Okay, okay, excuse Thank me. You. Don't ask me for my long voice now. <laughs> okay, no problem. My question is, you talk about the children being removed from the house, and my experience has been that that's the answer every time. It, again, yeah. Again, yeah. it's emotional for me, and yeah. I thank God for Jesus. Thank you for mentioning him. Yeah. Yeah. Took me a long way. 
The question is, based on what you say is not true anymore, because I have a great granddaughter. I'm a one-year-old great grandmother. And I saw the threat of that my grandchild, my great granddaughter being removed from her mom. Mm -hmm. So tell me where is the resource that protects the removal of the child from the only parent that they have mm -hmm. so they don't have to go through what you talk about. Yeah. And I refuse to give a clue as to my story because I have a 51 year old son who is still not a man in his own life because he was taken from me by BCW, mm -hmm. um, Bedford Avenue, and Fulton. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus. Mm. Please pardon the nice. interruption. Can I please have a custodian? Uh, please come to the guidance suite on the first floor. Can and now please I am to the dealing with a young man floor. who Thank you. the system turned out and his quote unquote big up his chest five time felon. You don't take my child from me and do that to it. So before my great granddaughter become a casualty of what I see in my granddaughter, because I'm, I'm relating to everything that is being said and it hurts. It hurts. So yeah. Thank God for Jesus who needed help. And the minister said recently, even though Jesus knew what was going on, he still picked the devil to be one of his helpers. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm being, I'm trying to, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, like I said, I'm a one-year-old great-grandmother. Okay? So, and I have a total of eight children. My firstborn was taken by BCW, yeah. and I need somebody yeah. to tell me how do I protect my great granddaughter from participating in that centrifuge condition that churn out stories like these. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So, my great, my great question. So, one of the things that I um, that I that I tell people as far as like resources is. To, is to utilize, sorry, is to utilize community-based organizations that are not associated with the ACS that they're dealing with, right? So like of the organization that I, I deal with, we partner with ACS to find out what the client needs and then connect them to the resource to provide those needs for that family. And what happens with that is once the family gets the needs that they have, whether it's therapy, whether it's clothing, whether it's food, whether whether it's help even with, uh, with with employment and resources, then there's no need for that ACS case to be open. And so that's how you close cases. Because when you have um, cases where there's neglect, right? Because they're criminalizing neglect. And when someone just needs help, you're going to take my child because I need help. No, that's, that's, that's not the, the help that I need, right? You removing um, my dependent doesn't help me um, come out of the situation that I'm in. But there are a lot of organizations like Safe Families, and I, give, I can give you some more, right? Like this, right? When, when yeah, finish, when we finish, I can yeah. give you some more, right? I appreciate I was you. Like, I was like, with, um, with ACF Forestdale, right? You have, there's other agencies that you can say, hey, here's, here's what we need. Here's what we need help with, because even with like a, with like SNAP assistance and public assistance, there's a 45 day wait, and you're not guaranteed that help. And even with that help, it can, you know, it it can. I it think can with the side of town, you know? I, hear the, I hear the reality. Yeah, of it. The, you, you, the just have the, you just have the aftermath. Right. I live with the people that go through it. Right. And so I listen and, to the hurt. Right. So I and, I am the people. Right? Yeah. I'm like, you saw, you heard 10 seconds, right, yeah. of, of the, the things that, you know, that I had to go through. And my mom, I came back home from foster care. My mom didn't have the finances to support us. I started working at nine. So I was babysitting five kids in order to help my mother support mm -hmm. the household. So I haven't, I don't, I don't remember not paying a bill. I was paying rent, paying for food. Mm -hmm. We were raising me together. 
you know? And I was like, that's the circumstances that we were in. And I made a lot of bad choices. I went a lot around the wrong path. And then I found God, right? And he watched us and he found me, right? Um, and he did, a, he did a work in me yes. and changed my life into being an advocate instead of just being the victim, victim of my circumstances. Of course you can. And I'm like, but there are, I was like, but I wasn't educated on what was out there. So because I was frustrated by the limited information that I had, I felt stuck and only, um, and only thought that what was in front of me, what was available, and that wasn't the truth. So uh, I, I, I'll absolutely share more resources with you, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. she's becoming and I said you need to get help for her but the auntie said she don't want to think of a can of work mm. so she's not getting help for the child mm. so I took it on myself go. one day and I called the doctor because she's my granddaughter so I can always take her to the doctor you know to see if she could get some help or refer me to somebody but I changed my mind I said I don't want to do this I don't want to get any problems you know mm -hmm. take her that to part the that part anyways, she just moving from home to home, home to home. Texas, um, New York, Bronx, all over. Finally, she's in Connecticut now. But wherever she goes, we all Same stop. issue. And she opened to me and she told me a lot of stuff. And I would like to tell the auntie, but the auntie don't listen to her. I told the auntie, I said, you need to sit down and have a, a conversation with her. You need to talk to her. The auntie said she don't have no time because when she comes home from work, she's tired. So she don't, and I don't know Oof. how to speak to the auntie with the things that she told me. Yeah. So I don't know how to deal with it because now she's in high school. Mm. The fights, the fights, the fights, the disrespectful, to, she's very disrespectful teachers. And every day it's always something, always something with her. And I keep telling the auntie, you can get help for her. But she don't want to dig up a can of worm. I don't know what is that. Right. So how can I help her? Right. So I'm like, you, 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 you can jump in any time. I'm like, there, there's, three, there's three things happening there, right? Um, even us having this conversation now, not everyone has the emotional availability to deal with. The, her auntie has told you multiple times she can't handle it. She's told you I cannot handle the conversation. She is scared of what all will come out once the conversation is had. And it can be scary even to the adult, right? Adult doesn't mean I handle all, right? I'm like the, um, I'm like the help that she needs. If you're the one, right, who sees the need for the help, because what's happening with the, um, the teenager is you're just seeing the symptoms of the disease and since no one wants to deal with the disease you'll keep seeing the symptoms and until I was until I dealt with the disease that was going on within me I had a lot of different symptoms I had every symptom that you can possibly think of um, I had to go to someone who could handle it my mother could not handle it she, she wasn't the one she wasn't the one who I could talk to and sit down and tell everything about what happened. She just wasn't that person. It ended up for me being a teacher. A teacher was the one I can tell. I could tell, you know, you know, all those things. Um, and then she began to kind of walk through me, you know, walk with me through the steps of just being helpful. I could at the time the therapist that I had even wasn't helpful. The therapist that I have now is wonderful. We love her. You know, Terry is amazing. If you need her, I'll, I'll recommend you. Um, but I'm like, you, if you're the person who she can open up to, and you're the person that she can talk to, 
then the conversation that you have with her aunt is you have demonstrated that you're not ready. Right, right, yeah. She told me not to tell her aunt, but she told me. No, no, no. I'm not telling you to tell the aunt what she told what she confided in. What I'm saying is you have spoken to the aunt and said that, that she needs help. And the aunt has told you, I don't want to open up those cans of worms. She has demonstrated continuously to you that she doesn't have the capacity to deal with that. And so the conversation now is, well, I want to give her the help. I want to connect her with a resource that can help her because she deserves help, even though you can't be the one to give it. And so that's your gift to her and the gift to the aunt. Because who knows, later on down the line, when she sees the change that happens in the niece because she got the help that she needed, she then may be able to later on do the work for herself. Mm-hmm. Then I was like, because she's probably not telling you what happened to her either. Because if she's saying, I don't want to open up the can of worms, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So I'm like, if you're the app, you become the advocate. If you're the one that she can talk to, you're the one who provides the resource of, of connection that she, um, that she needs. And you, would you, you know, you tell the aunt that I'm going to provide her the the, um, the help. I'm going to connect her with, you know, a, someone who is in her school or someone, um, a therapy that she can have, you know, for wherever she is. Yeah. Because um, last week I told her that I don't have nothing more to say. Because I said it all, and she's not listening, and I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know what to do because she's just not. Don't give up on her. Don't give up on her. Because you're my thing is you're when you look at the symptoms and you see her, she is not a problem. She is having a hard time. So she is not an issue. She is having an issue. When you change your perspective. You will not see the the outward actions as her identity. That's not who she is. It's what she is doing to deal with what's going on in, in inside of her. So don't give up on her. So I'm going to do Find out what resources are around her. You know that she's in Connecticut? Yeah, you know that she's in Connecticut, in Connecticut and where she is in Connecticut? You, we, we got Google now. We got all sorts of things. Find out the resources that are in the community that she's in. If she's in a school out there, um, get in contact with the school that she's a part of. And may I'm, I'm telling you, the social worker at the school has resources for their kids. It's okay. Right? So it, yeah. because I just want to have Ms. Cross because she's in a school. Yes. Is there something that she can do to? So basically, the school system, she could work with the social worker as well as the guidance counselor to get herself outside. <laughs> So, we're not listening to Auntie anymore. Right. She, she needs the help. Because other than that, she's going to have a breakdown, and a breakdown is not going to be a good one. She's going to end up in the hospital. Yeah. And that's so what she's Because she's not going to be able to deal with it by herself. It's, it's troubling her. That's why she's acting out. That's why she's doing the things that she's doing. But she needs to be in some sort of therapy, some sort of counseling somewhere in school and outside mm-hmm. of school because she's been dealing with it for so long. Mm-hmm. Because remember, she's still going to be a young adult. I'm not sure what her age is, but you said that she was in high school. school. So, and, you know, and this is going to trickle over. Mm-hmm. She may have a child, and then, it, you know, and she may have that child may end up in the system because she never got the help. Mm-hmm. So we're affecting one generation to the next. Yeah. She needs to get help. You also have to be mindful of the consistency of care that you want to give. There is... The inability of someone who's going to hear you the first time, the second time, because I already say, I don't know what else to do. She doesn't need to hear that. What she needs to hear is the consistency. Everything is going to be all right. We're going to do whatever it takes to, to make this to be well. We're going to get you the help that you need. Consistently over the, that, that, that's what she walks away with in her head, because I don't know about you, but anybody who's upset and going through, they don't really hear you. All they are in is those loud voices that's in their head. And when you're able to continue to be repetitive and stay caring and stay wanting her to be her best and stay trying to help her, eventually, I don't know about you, but it's always worked for me, eventually it works. It does. Because your consistency in your care doesn't change. And they can hear it in your voice. 
And sometimes young people can even walk away from you saying, and you don't care. Oh, she doesn't even care anymore. But you don't mean, no, 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 no. You don't mean to sound like that. We're gonna, but that's what they hear. So we're going to wrap up. And then if you guys have further questions, we're going to, the panelists are made available for you guys. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. There's power in consistency. Right? Yes. Yes. A warm round of applause for Damali Cooper, for Ms. Renee Cox, we have Gerald Cooper, we have Tamara Jones. They've been here, they're sharing, they're giving all they can, and we appreciate all of you for being here today. Again, you're going to be able to speak to all of them, but I want you all to take out your phones right now if you can before we break. There's food, so we're going to feed you, okay? Um, but before you, before you break, take out your phones. Inside your program, there's a QR code. We're asking everyone to please complete the survey inside, right here. Just scan that QR code. Please complete that survey because this is how we're going to continue to get the support that we need because we want to show people this is a real issue. This is something that needs to continue to be discussed. We need the support that we need so that we can show that there is, there's, there's people who care about this topic. And so if you can... Please scan the QR code, take the survey, it's only 10 questions, literally it's very short, it's not hard at all. So if you don't have a program, we can get you a program. Do you, who needs a program? I'll give you one, you just scan the QR code right here. part in this. Uh, this is a movement and this is so that we can help change generations to come. Right? It stops with you. Right? And so we just want to keep encouraging you guys to fight the good fight. Alright? Thank you so much. Just in the back